you have your Bibles, uh, turn with me to Genesis chapter 12. Uh, we're going to be in several places tonight. And tonight I want to talk to you about waiting on God. Waiting on God. Waiting on God. Let me give you the outline that you see. Number one, the promise made. The promise made. Number two, the cost of not waiting. The cost of not waiting. And number three, the blessings of waiting on God. The blessings on waiting on God. And I've said this many times, and I'm going to say it uh, again, of all the nine fruits of the Spirit, I think the hardest one and the last one we master is patience. Okay? Because we are not a patient people. Uh, we are not a patient society. And, you know, we live in a hurry-up, fast-paced world. You know, you can have hot tea in 90 seconds, oatmeal in two minutes, popcorn in three minutes, and your credit score done in less than five minutes now. Uh, so, and what's the most popular restaurants? Use the most fast food, okay? We don't like to avoid lying, uh, and we want our food right away. Uh, it is not that way with God. His Holy Word tells us His ways are not our ways. His thoughts are not our thoughts. And here's the one you have to understand. And His timing is not always our timing. God has, God never has to be in a hurry. And I promise you, there will be no clocks in heaven. Okay, no alarms. All right, time is nothing uh, to God. As a matter of fact, one thing I have learned in my 64 years of life is when I get in a hurry, there are greater chances for mistakes and missing the perfect will of God. To put it another way, good things come to those who learn to wait on God and be patient in his timing. Let's look at this Old Testament example of the importance of waiting on God. Genesis 12, verse uh, 1. The promise made. Now the Lord said to Abram, and again we know Abram was a Chaldean by birth. He was a Gentile, and uh, you know God basically chose him uh, and and Sarah uh, for three things. Number one, it started the Jewish nation. Number two, the word of God uh, came to mankind, and that would be through Moses. Then number three. His lineage would be the Savior of the world, which would be Jesus Christ. And basically, in, in uh, talking about Abram, seven times God spoke to Abram or Abraham uh, later on when his name was changed. So uh, it's, it's just important to see, uh, you know, that he was even called in uh, Hebrews chapter 11, the father of faith. And really, folks, faith is the key to waiting on God. And I'll say that again. Faith is the key to waiting on God. Now, the Lord said to Abram, get out of your country. And there's seven promises here. Seven promises. He was going to a place he had never been to, a place that he had never seen. And folks, that takes faith from your family. And, and again, you know, when it comes to family, there's, there's always family issues a uh, lot, and you pretty much know all uh, that, so I won't go into that. And from your father's house, uh, idolatry, you know, there was just so many things, uh, you know, as far as family and beliefs and all that was going on there. Uh, but God chose uh, Abram uh, for this specific call, cause to a land that I will show you. And, and here's the seven promises. I will make you a great nation. I will bless you. All right? By the way, he was the first Jew, the Jewish nation. He was the first. I will make your name great, and you shall be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you. I will curse him who curses you, and in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. 
So God starts a covenant relationship with Abraham. And these blessings were given to him so that he could be a blessing to others. And God made promises before. Uh, look, look back in chapter 8 of Genesis. We know about uh, what mankind had become. Uh, they were evil. God said, I wish I'd never uh, you know, created y'all. Uh, he gave the flood. You know, everyone but Noah and his family died. Okay? And, and it says, when he came out, verse 20, verse 8, I mean, chapter 8, verse 20, uh, then Noah built an altar to the Lord and took every clean animal of every clean bird and offered burnt offerings on the altar. And the Lord smelled a soothing aroma. Then the Lord said in his heart, I will never again curse the ground for man's sake. Although the imagination of man's heart is evil from his youth, nor will I ever again destroy every living thing as I have done. But again, folks, the Bible tells us that we were born into sin. Uh, and you, you just turn on the news, especially the national news, for five minutes, and you will see that man's heart is evil. But he, he made the promise I will not destroy the earth again. I will not flood the earth again. And of course, we know that the rainbow uh, was a part of that promise. And then another promise, uh, Hebrews 13. That was Old Testament, but I wanted to give you a New Testament promise also. Hebrews 13. The Bible says in Hebrews 13, verse 7, Remember those who have rule over you, who has spoken the word of God to you, whose faith follow, considering the outcome of their conduct. In verse 8 was what I wanted to read to you. Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever. And when we think of Jesus Christ, folks, I am telling you that will never change. Jesus was the Son of God. Jesus was born of a virgin. Jesus came to this earth uh, for the salvation of mankind. But also here, uh, in, in, in other places in the New Testament, he was, taught, he was talked about as the living Word. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was God, and the Word was with God. So the promises that he makes in the Word of God will always be yes, true, and amen. If God makes a promise, he will keep that promise. True faith is based on the Word of God, which leads us to obedience. So we see early on here in, in Genesis 12 that the promise was made. The second thing I want to share with you, the cost of not waiting. The cost of not waiting. Look at verse or chapter 15. Chapter 15. And again, chapter 14, Lot, Lot did his thing. Uh, you know, Abram had to go and rescue him. He made enemies along the way. And that's why in, in chapter 15, you'll see where he had some fear uh, because he was afraid these Gentile kings would come and attack him. But in verse 15, or chapter 15, after these things, the word of the Lord came to Abram in the vision saying, do not be afraid, Abram. I am your shield, your exceedingly great reward. And there was two things that I noticed here. Number one, this is the first time you see the word of the Lord came in Genesis. Okay, God spoke to Abraham. And the second thing is, is the promise of not to not be afraid. Do not be afraid. Uh, I've heard several uh, pr preachers say that uh, fear, you know, uh, uh, do not fear is used in the Word of God 365 times, uh, which basically means do not fear, uh, you know, a whole year, 365 days of the year. And part of understanding God and not fearing is having faith in God and realizing who God is. He is our shield, okay? In verse 2, and Abram, and Abram said, Lord God, what will you give me, seeing I go childless, and the heir of my house is Eliezer, 
of Damascus. And again, in verse tw- and in chapter 12, I forgot to mention this, that Abram was 75 years old. 75 years old. And here he is talking about uh, his, his wife, uh, Sarah. Sarah or Sarah. Well, let's just say Sarah for, for that. Uh, she wanted a child. Uh, you know, God had promised them. Matter of fact, even down here, he says, uh, you know, your family will be as many as the stars in the sky. And, and even in chapter 13, he compares it as the dust on the ground. I mean, it's like saying you can't count sand granules. Okay, so what it basically means, he will be the father of all of mankind. And it says, then Abram said in verse 3, look, you have given me no offspring. Indeed, one born in my house is my heir. And Eliezer was uh, going to be, because he had no son, uh, he was going to be uh, the heir of his household. Then verse 4, and behold, the word of the Lord came to him saying, this one shall not be your heir, but one who will come from your own body shall be your heir. And then he brought him outside and said, look now toward heaven and count the stars if you are able to number them. And of course, we can't do that, folks. You can't, I mean, you can look up, one is you'll lose your place, two is there's just too many. There's just way too many. And he said, and he, and he said to them, so shall your descendants be. And here's a turning point in Genesis. And he believed the Lord. Okay, what is belief? It is faith. He believed the promises of God. And he counted it, accounted it to him for righteousness. Folks, he was also the first Christian. By faith, he believed God. By faith. And he was the first Christian. And, and we understand, you know, in the Old Testament, you know, the whole deal, folks, is you had to believe in a coming Messiah. Okay? You had to believe in something that hadn't even taken place yet. And, you know, and the other thing about not waiting on God it's never good to get ahead of God, okay? Uh, we don't need to get behind God. We need to walk beside God, but we certainly don't need to get ahead of God. Now go to verse six, or chapter 16. 16.1. At this point, he was 85 years old, okay? 85 years old. And Sarai, Abram's wife, had borne him no children. And she had an Egyptian maidservant whose name was Hagar. So Sarai said to Abram, See now, the Lord has restrained me from bearing children. Please go into, uh, go to my uh, maid. Perhaps I shall obtain children by her. And there's two things, two problems here. Number one, she doubted God. She obviously didn't believe it was going to happen. They were getting older and thinking, Man, I, I won't have a children. I want a child. I, I, you know, I, I want a child. And then also with him, uh, I personally believe he should have put his foot down and said, ah, that ain't going to happen. Okay? Even though, you know, in those days, it wasn't wrong to have two wives. Okay? I, and again, I don't make the rules, folks. I'm just telling you how it was back then. And you will see this here in just a second. And it says... Uh, and Abram heeded the voice of Sarai. And Sarai, Adam, Ad, Ad, uh, Abram's wife, took Hagar, her maid, the Egyptian, and gave her to the husband, Abram, to be his wife. Folks, that is a huge mistake. Okay? I mean, the Bible tells us, you know, it's one man for one woman. It was Adam and Eve. Okay? And, and when you start, you know, really... One, going against the Word of God. Two, not waiting on God. Good, I mean, bad things uh, begin to happen. And after Abram had dwelt ten years in the land of Canaan, so he went to Hagar, and she conceived. And when she saw that she had conceived, her mistress uh, became despised in her eyes. What seemed to be a good deal, she got pregnant right away. She was... She had she was carrying Abram's, uh, you know, son, and you know how I'm just telling you, folks. 
It's called jealousy, all right? And you, I'm just telling you, don't get in a, a, a jealous woman. You better stay away. I'm just telling you now, they, they will defend, they will. I've, I've seen it, okay? Lori, just a long time ago, just said, hey, I'm telling you, you know, you'll be done, you know? She said, if you even think about it, all right, you know, you better run because I will find you and, and I will kill you, is, is basically what she told me. Now, again, it didn't strike fear in me, but I'm just going by not just what she said. I'm just, it's just not good. You know, it's just not good. And then the Bible says, Then Sarai said to Abram, My wrong be upon you. I gave my maid into, into your embrace. And when she saw that she had conceived, I became despised in her eyes. And the Lord judged between you and me. And as you look down through here, folks, there were several bad decisions made, okay, bad decisions. So Abram said to Sarah, indeed, your maid is in your hand. Do to her, do to her as you please. And when Sarah dealt harshly with her, she fled from her presence. And, uh, you know, I want to say this too. There are consequences to not waiting. God made a promise in chapter 12 that he would be the father of many nations. He two or three times, even in the scripture that we read, said they will be as many as the stars in heaven. They will be as many as the dust that is on earth. And he knew it. He, he said it to her and, and to him. But yet they, they did not wait. He was trying to please her. But again, folks, the man has to take control there. Okay? He, he needed to say, hey, you know what? I, I don't see anything good coming out of that. And if you even think about it, from that conception, 4,000 years later, the, A, the Arab nations and all that is going against Israel, we are still fighting that battle now because they made a poor choice and went against the promises of God and the Word of God. Deuteronomy, hold your finger there. Go to Deuteronomy 11. Deuteronomy 11, verse 26. Behold, I set before you today a blessing and a curse. The blessing, if you obey the commandments of the Lord your God, which I command you, and a curse, if you uh, do not obey the commandments of the Lord your God, but turn aside from the way which I commanded you today and go after other gods which you have not known. So the cost of of, of not waiting, I mean, jealousy, uh, dysfunctional uh, family uh, relationships, a uh, child that, you know, out of wedlock, Ishmael, we, we know uh, that's what happened, and, and I'm telling you, Hagar ha had to leave uh, and, and go, and, and there was just animosity and hate there. But we see the promise made, we see the cost of not, waiting. And the last thing I want you to see is the blessings of waiting on God. Folks, I am telling you, there are blessings on waiting on God. And it's hard to do because we are so impatient, impatient people. Uh, go with me to Genesis 21. Genesis 21, verse 1. And the Lord visited Sarah as he had said, and the Lord did uh, for Sarah as he had spoken. For Sarah conceived and bore, bore Abraham a son in his old age at the time, uh, at the set time of which God has spoken to him. Folks, God knows everything. God knew the day, uh, you know, Isaac was going to be born. God knew the day that you were going to be born. He today knows the day of your death. People don't like to think about that, but folks, he's God. And when God tells us something, especially through Scripture, we need to hang on to the promises of God. We need to hang on to the promises of God. In verse 3, And Abraham called the name of his son who was born to him, whom Sarah bore to him, Isaac. And then Abraham circumcised his son Isaac when he was eight days old, as God had commanded him. 
Uh, Abram was 100 years old when his son Isaac was born to him. You ever ask yourself why he waited till 100? You know why? Because that old, it had to be a miracle of God. See, before he conceived with Hagar when he was older, but the but God wanted him to know and wanted people to know with God all things are possible. Okay? And I'll, I'll quote what I said earlier, folks. God's ways are not man's ways, and man's ways are sure not God's way. But God is in control of every situation. And folks, this boils over to our prayer life. We'll pray and we'll pray and we'll pray and we'll pray, and then we'll just... Quit praying. Why? Because God didn't answer us the way we thought he ought to answer us. And I've said it before, folks, there's three answers God can give to us, and two of the three we don't like. Okay? The first one we like, yes, you can have it, and you can have it right now. It's in my will. It's good for you. Something good is going to come out of this. The second one we don't like, no. No, we don't like no. We don't like anything that says no. Can you have this? No. I mean, we just don't like that. But many times God is looking out for us. We either don't need it or we don't need it right then. And that takes us to the third answer, which is wait. And here's where we mess up, folks. When we quit praying, we are out of the will of God because we are not listening to God. We are not praying to God. We have given up on something God says. Just wait. Just don't do it now. And I could give you all kinds of examples in 40 years of ministry of people that have come to me in counseling and just said, man, we should have waited. We should have waited. We should have waited. But let's look at the blessings of God. Uh, had the son Isaac uh, was born, and uh, it was just, it was just a, a, a great thing. It really was. And chapter 22, sometime uh, between now and Sunday, just read chapter 22. And it's one, of the, it's one of my favorite chapters in the Old Testament between Abraham and Isaac. And it is a perfect picture of what Jesus did on the cross for us. Let's, let's look at uh, some scripture here uh, on waiting on God. I, God. Isaiah 40, Isaiah 40, you, you know this one, but I still want to remind you of it. Isaiah 40, have you not known, verse 28, have you not heard the everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth? He neither faints nor is weary. His understanding is unsearchable. We don't understand what God's up to at times. But God is always up to something. He has a purpose and a reason to make you wait. He's not punishing you. We think he punishes us when he makes us wait. But he is looking out for us. He gives power to the weak. To those who have no might, he, in he increases strength. Even the youth shall faint and be weary. It's kind, of, it's kind of like kids that are hyper. I mean, you can't slow them down and they just want to go 90 miles an hour they don't like to sit still okay and the young men shall ultimately fall but here's the verse but those that wait on the lord shall renew their strength they shall mount up with wings like eagles they shall run and not be weary they shall walk and not faint folks there is power in waiting there was power in waiting god gives you strength god will get you you through it. You will come out on the other side. You will be better on the other side if you will just wait. Isaiah 30. Isaiah 30, verse 18. Therefore the Lord will wait that he may be gracious to you, and therefore he will be exalted that he may have mercy on you. For the Lord is a God of justice. Look at this. Blessed. What does that mean? Happy. We talked about the Beatitudes Sunday. Happy are all those who wait for him. Psalm 27. Psalm 27. 
The Bible says in Psalm 27, 14, Wait on the Lord, be of good courage, and he shall strengthen your heart. Wait, I say, on the Lord. Psalm 62, Psalm 62, verse 1 and 2, Truly my soul silently waits for God. From him comes my salvation. He is my rock and my salvation. He is my defense. I shall not be moved. And I look down to verse 5. My soul waits silently for God alone, for my expectation is from Him. Folks, He'll come through. I'm telling you, He will come through. He is only, only He only is my rock and salvation. He's my def- defense. I shall not be moved. In God is my salvation and my glory. The rock of my strength and my refuge is God. Trust in Him at all times, you people. Pour out your heart before Him. God is a refuge for us. And then one that you know, go to Proverbs 3. Proverbs 3, verse 5. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not to your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge Him, and He shall direct your path. Do not be wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord. Depart from evil. It will be health to your flesh and strength to your bones. I did some research here, and I just want to read this in closing on waiting on God. There are over 160 verses in the Bible that refer to waiting on God. And people that waited on God in the Bible, Joshua had to wait seven days for the walls of Jericho to fall down. The Apostle Paul spent three years in the desert learning and waiting for his ministry assignment. The prophet Elijah waited three and a half years for rain. Abraham, which we talked about, waited 25 years for a son named Isaac. Joseph waited 13 years to see God's uh, dream come true in his life. Jacob waited and worked 14 years for his wife, Rebekah. Moses waited 40 years to lead the children out of Israel, uh, out of Egypt, into the promised land. Israel waited 40 years in the desert before God gave them the promised land. The children of Israel waited 70 years in exile before being released back to Jerusalem. And Noah waited 100 years to see rain. Folks, the Bible tells us good things come to those who wait. Father, thank you for your word. And God, I know it's hard. I know it's hard. I, I am not an especially patient person either. But God, I, I am learning as I am growing older. You know, we, we can't always make things happen. We can't always control every situation in our life. And God, there are times that you tell us just to wait. And God, I pray that we would be sensitive to those times. And God, I pray especially when it comes to waiting in our prayer life, God, I pray we wouldn't give up on a person. I mean nobody, nobody. I pray that if you have put something on our heart or put someone on our heart especially, God, I pray that we would just keep praying and just keep praying. God, I've heard testimony. I know in Lawton, Oklahoma, a lady waited 42 years to see her husband say, God, I I know that was worth waiting for. So God, as we grow older and as we disciple people, as we give advice as grandmas and grandpas, God, I would pray that we would really let people know there are just times in our life that we need to wait. We don't need to do anything. We need to wait for God's timing. So God, I I thank you for the promise of your blessing on those who wait. And God, I pray that we would be patient people waiting for the day. It's just like the rapture of the church. Man, I'm ready today. I'm ready right now. But yet, Lord, there's still people that need to be saved. There's still people that need to get close to you. And God, there's a reason that you are waiting. And God, uh, who are we? 
try to justify our impatience. But God, I pray that we would just wait on you and wait on your word and, and keep our face in the word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We thank you for joining us this evening at Rahel Baptist Church, and may God richly bless you.